and I'm I'm doing uh, one of my events with Daniel. Daniel tells me, guess who's getting married? And I go, who? He goes, Barrett, our bass player. Remember Barrett? And I go, yeah, yeah, I remember Barrett. And he goes, guess who's he's, he's marrying? Because I'm like, wait a minute. Didn't Barrett go into porn? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. And I go, oh, who's he marrying? He goes, Stormy Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> I can't make this shit up, man. Uh, it's, it's just unbelievable. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Level Up Cleveland as we start season four here with you guys. We have brought with us in here Mr. Mark Rasmussen. Hello, hello. And he is the owner of No Cover Magazine, and he also runs it. I mean, basically, you're the one-man show on the whole entire (laughs) magazine. And anybody that's not familiar with No Cover, here's the newest edition that just came out. Oh, thank you. And um, I usually have the the Tropodelic one in the background, no cover. But anybody that's familiar with it, they you know these are free magazines that you put out there, and it's basically their entertainment magazines. There have featured guests on there. You can find out what's going on on through these, kind of like the Scene magazine used to be back in the day. But this is a much better and much, I must say, nicer. I mean, it's a beautiful magazine. At a time when magazines aren't as popular as they must have been, you've come out with one of the nicest ones, <laughs> especially for, for no cost, I mean, for no cover. Thank you. Yeah, it's excellent. Thank you. Um, you you've, you've also are a part of the Cleveland Award uh, Music Awards that have been going on. Okay, so it was the, this was the first one, and we already had Grunge DNA on here, mm-hmm. and we had uh, Great Bad Band. We had Bad Juju on here. Great band. These guys are all nominated. Yep. Uh, Bad Juju actually won for Best Cover Tribute Band, I believe, this year. Yep. Um, Which is kind of ironic because I do no cover. Yeah. And it's <laughs> all original music. That's No cover is free, you know, and all original music. That's what started No Cover. Yeah, right. But you have to have these categories. You have gotta to have, have, gotta have the categories. Well, and there's so many good cover bands. Like, like the fact that you had the, the, the four that you had nominated. They're incredible. For, yeah. They're incredible. They're all really it's good like, bands. how can you not have them? Yeah. Really, right. really cool. Your story goes way back, though. Like, like there's all kinds of things that get you to this point. All kinds of neat things. I mean, like, like, like researching you has been, a, has been a, as much fun, I think, as interviewing is going to be. Um, but okay, let's start. Let's start from. Let's start from the back. Let's start, let's, let's take you back because what we're going to get into is what you got coming up here, which is pretty big, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. Okay. But but I want to go back. What what starts you off? How do you begin? What, what I mean, I'm sure you could take a lot of different points at yeah. time. What what's the one that you remember? Is the one you think the changing point was? Well, there there's two changing points uh, here in Cleveland. The first one when I was a kid, I was like 17 years old. And this guy would come over, and he dressed like Robert Smith from The Cure. Oh, yeah, and, and that's the singer. Well, yeah I, yeah, I didn't know too much about this. But I'm guy. saying that's who it is. In case anyone doesn't know The Cure, that's the singer. Oh, the singer, yeah, yeah, yeah Robert yeah. Smith. He had the, the hair, yes. and he had the, the yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Other other than the hair wasn't as crazy, but he wore the guy liner, the 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 lipstick, the uh, black nail polish, and all black, you know. And and I was a kid. <laughs> I was a little soccer kid with a mullet in the back, you know, business in the front, party in the back. (laughs) I thought I was the coolest of cool. And I was a big metalhead, just loved metal music. And I didn't really open my ears up to anything else. And this guy would come over, and I just thought he was a little off. And I was like, you know, I shouldn't be judgmental, but I was a kid. And he would come over, and my mom one day said, hey, you know, this guy's going to come over. He's going to he's going to come over for Christmas because we um, or his family's going out of town and he was dating Sue Meckler, which was my mom's best friend's daughter at the time. And so I was like, oh, all right, great. Um, she's like, 
well, he bought you something. And I go, he bought me something. He's like, yeah, you should get him something for Christmas. I'm like, I'm not going to get that guy anything. <laughs> and I go, he's probably going to give me his album from his band because he's in this band. He kept talking about this band. And I was like, all right, whatever. I, I just didn't care. And sure enough, come Christmas Day, I forget what year it was. I can go back and find it for you later on. But he gives me this giant square, right? And if everybody's watching, which probably younger and hopefully a little older, um, but that was called an album. And uh, <laughs> people used to use that and put it on a turntable and, and play music. And uh, I opened it up and it said, uh, this will be worth something someday when I'm famous. And it said Trent Reznor. Oh, wow. It was from Exotic Birds. And I still have the album. Um, my, well, actually, my mom probably does in her in her attic somewhere. But uh, yeah, that was my first time at learning that okay, this person is really, really confident. Why does this person have so much confidence? You know. And I listened to the music, and and I'm like, I don't get it. I just don't get it. To me, I thought Exotic Birds were more like. Uh, and I'm probably going to get slammed on this because we're here in Cleveland. Um, but like the cure meets the flock of seagulls, but not as good. Right. And I was like, mm, I just don't get it. But Trent intrigued me, you know, just the confidence he had, the aura he had. And, you know, my mom actually know, knew him better because she would take him to, um, uh, dates and stuff because he didn't have a car and sue didn't have a car so they would pick him up and drive him and, and drop him off at places in cleveland and i really didn't pay attention to him until one day my mom threw a scene magazine scene magazine down and that's when it was a smaller size and uh said hey uh you know sue's a, a friend you know trent he's like he just got on the cover of this magazine you want to see it and and i said nin i'm like what's nin <laughs> I'm like, this is this is crazy and, and nine inch nails obviously and uh i was like hmm and i'm like he got signed I'm like but, and i'm like it's obviously a different band and uh i remember sue said hey you know um my mom was going out of town and and i was a party kid and she's like there's no way we're leaving you alone and sue's gonna watch you and so same time so she went out of town and sue came over took me to the fantasy theater in lakewood and i remember going to my first nine inch nails concert and uh, i was like this is this is insane this yeah, was, this is cool this is this is better than exotic birds yeah right, right? so <laughs> i was like all right cool so that was a changing moment because when i met trent just a brief, I didn't, I didn't meet him very often, uh, just that show. And then that one time uh, for Christmas, and then a couple times he came over to the house and he had to get something uh, for my mom that she left. And I was like, I, I didn't really pay attention to him. But I did notice he had that, that what I call, and most people call now the it factor, yeah. right? Because if you don't have confidence, if you don't believe in yourself, how are you going to get other people to believe in you? And, and so I kind of took that away. Um, the second instance that changed my life was I was bartending in the flats, the old flats. And it was a place called Banana Joe's. I don't know if you remember Banana Joe's. It was, I don't. It was attached to this nightclub. And uh, I just started bartending. I just turned 21. I was, I was between college. And, uh, you know, I was going to Bowling Green, and I would come home, and I would work the summers. It was beautiful. I loved it there during that time. And I met these two guys, Rick. I think it was Rick and Rick. One was from the Free Times, and then one was from the Scene Magazine. Oh. And they got together, and they formed a baby. And their baby was called River Burns. And so I got to learn how to do a publication by working with those two. Oh. Because I said, well, you know, what do you guys do? And they're like, oh, we do this magazine. It's called River Burns. And and I was like, oh, that's cool. I'm like, I like it. And I go, do you guys need any help? And they said, yeah, you can be our intern. 
And I'll go, cool, what's an intern? <laughs> it's basically you work for free. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, at least at that time I did. You know? And so I remember going into their office in Rocky River, and there's this, uh, it was giant, it was pretty big office, but it was completely empty. And I walked in, they said, meet, meet us here. And we're going to train you and we're going to teach you and we'll show you, you know. And I only worked during the summers because I was going to college at the time. So I would bartend at night, work in the day uh, for these guys. And so I walked into the room and it's this huge, huge, huge room. And all I saw was a card table and a fold-up chair <laughs> and a telephone that was actually connected to the wall. You know, so yeah, that, right that, back before that happened. Yeah, that, tell, yeah. <laughs> that tells you a little bit of how long ago this was. And I, I meet them, and they open up the, the fold-up table, tiny little table, and they open up the chair, they put the telephone down, and then they slammed the yellow pages. And they said, or, or maybe it was a white pages, I can't remember, but said, go get us some advertising. And I go, what? And they're like, yeah, we're going to tell you what to say, write it down on this legal pad and then call every single person you can call and set up appointments for us. And that's how I got started in the magazine business. So. Wow. So you learned the most difficult part of this whole entire process first, correct? which is getting advertisers to actually spend money with you. Exactly. And what's crazy is they only had one issue at the time. You know, and so, so that's I, all you had to use to, to try to get these people for advertisers. Say, well, we got this one. Yeah, we got we got one issue, and you know they were selling ads, but I was sending the appointments, and then eventually, uh, the the one Rick took me out onto uh, sales calls. So I went on to the sales calls with him, and I remember the first one sales call I went to was actually Shooters downtown, and uh, I wound up. Uh, he goes, "Okay, Mark, this is one you can sell," and I go, "I don't know how to sell." And he goes, you've been watching me. Now this one you can sell. And I remember I sold, I don't know who I talked to at the time, but I sold my first ad to shooters ever. And it was half, I, I wound up only getting half the money and half trade. And they're like, we're going to give you trade. And I go, what's trade? It's like, well, it's kind of like free bucks. You can use at the bar, you can buy food, you can buy alcohol, you can do everything, but you can't tip. You got to tip in cash. And I'm like, Okay, so we use that trade to bring other people, other clients, entertain to get more advertising. Oh, so that's kind of how I learned the business, and 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 it was a great learning experience because I had, I did not know one thing, and I learned trial by fire, and I was probably too stupid enough to know how difficult it was. I just thought. <sighs> Oh, I could do this. I could just talk to someone and they're going to give me money. You know, I, I had no idea how difficult selling advertising is. You know, let me, the fact that you did it in this order, like the way you had learned it, like I just said, like you learned that first. Like that's, like I said, that's something that that's the hardest part of anyone who can put a magazine together if you have the money to do it. Right. You know what I mean? If you didn't, if it didn't happen that way, and if it happened any other way, do you think that you would have that things would have gone the way they did, or do you think? I mean, no. it's, it sounds to me like Rick and Rick. And I got to be honest with you, I don't like the fact that they didn't. I mean, you could be rich, you could be Dick. Why can't one of them take one of the other names and make it easier yeah. so we know who's who? <laughs> but what Rick and Rick just sounds like also that you you, you came into a, the, the situation where you had good teachers. Like these guys were willing to be like, no, you're going to do it. Yes. Like how many people just do everything and don't let anybody else like just. Come, I need your help, and then you go to help them, and then like I'll just take care of it. I'll just yeah. right, just go over there and clean up the, the the. But these guys kept saying, "No, you do this one, you do that." That's and, right. And having that kind of stuff, it changes the game, right? I mean, basically, I was taking my education in marketing and learning what and applying it in practicality to yeah. real life yeah. because you can read the book and you can study and you can do all that and you can pass a test. But how does that really apply to real life? Yeah, they didn't have trade. They didn't have. They trade. didn't have no. trade in that class, right? No, they didn't not tell at you all. about that that part of it, right? You no. had to learn that part, right? Interesting, awesome. So now you take this idea, right? You take what you've just learned, mm -hmm. and how does how does that manifest into like? Are you? It, let me just ask this question: Are you one of them people who just constantly always seem to think big, like like uh, like you would always take 
where regular people are, you know, they so a lot of people will think smaller and smaller increments. Well, you know, you just get a job and you just, you know, you go do yeah. your thing. And you, yeah. But did you always find yourself always like you, once you learn something, you're like, well, how do I apply this to make this this oh, yeah. bigger thing out of it? Is that how you kind of like operate? It, oh yeah, I I think I'm cursed that way <laughs> because I'll get an idea in my head and I will literally work out the business idea. I'll come up with a logo. I'll come up with the idea. I'll, I'll think of how big it can be. And then I'll let it go, but then it'll just keep bugging me, bugging me, bugging me, bugging me, bugging me. And I'm like, okay, this is something I need to do. I have to do this or I can't get it out of my head. Yeah. And so I just do it. I just do it because I, that's the way I've been operating. I mean, what, I grew up, my dad owned an ad agency here in Cleveland and he worked for the big ag agencies before. And so, you know, I was named after Mark Weiss. So my my dad worked for Weiss Advertising, which is a, a, a big one here in, in Cleveland for a while. And he designed the, 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 he was a creative director. He did the Cleveland Force logo oh. back in the day. Yeah, which is kind of cool because I, I found a, a t-shirt with, with that logo the other day and I, I got it. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. I forgot. I totally forgot all about it. So, um, but yeah, my dad was an inspiration for me because I would go to the ad agency and then I would just see what he did and how he left working for someone else, started his own ad agency and then partnered up with someone. And, and, and as it was growing, it was doing really, really well. And unfortunately my dad died of colon cancer. And then that changed my life too, because, you know, I was in school and I was thinking I was just going to go work for my dad. You know, oh. I was like, this is it. I'm, I'm set. I'll just go work for my dad. Uh, but then after he passed away, I was like, what am I going to do? I got an advertising marketing degree. What am I going to do? I'm like, might as well go to Los Angeles. Los Angeles is where. Why do you think? Well, because <laughs> that's where all the ad agencies are. So, oh, oh, really? So that's what uh, that yeah. works that way, too. Yeah. But before I got to L.A., I wound up getting to do an internship in uh, South Carolina in Greenville, South Carolina. And I remember I was working, it was probably one of the first few days I was there, two of the girls that I knew from college, Gabby and uh, Debbie, they were living down there. They had jobs. I was broke as a joke. They said, you can live with us until you can find something. And I was like, okay, cool. I just wanted to change a pace. And I, I wound up working for Henderson Advertising um, and working on Delta faucets and, you know, really boring stuff. Uh, but I needed a job. And so it was New Year's Eve that was coming up. And I was like, this is probably a good time. People are not going to show up for work. And they're going to need somebody to fill in. So I knocked on the doors. And, and I meet this guy, um, Doug. And he was the bar manager at the Hilton. And I said, okay, I've got bartending experience. And he's like, yeah, we need a bartender. You know, didn't, she didn't show up. And I was like, cool. I'm like, can you, can you work today? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm totally down. So they filled out every, everything I needed to do, and I went and I started working. And I remember um, as I was setting up the bar, which is kind of funny, because they they have the mini bottles in uh, South Carolina. So I'm used to pouring the you know 750s, and and there's these tiny little mini bottles. So I'm like setting all these mini bottles up in my little bar, you know, and, and they're all set up with one shot or whatever the you know, it is that you needed to pour. I can't, I can't recall, but this guy gets on and he's like testing, testing one, two, testing one, two. And I go, Hey man, I go, what band's playing? Cause I thought I was cool. I met Trent Reznor. I know Nine Inch Nails or I, I know of Nine Inch Nails. And, uh, he goes, Hootie and the Blowfish. And I go, Hootie and the Blowfish. I go, what a stupid effing name that is. <laughs> You know, and he just kind of looked at me and like, whatever. I thought he was the roadie. I thought he was just a sound guy. And uh, it turned out to be Darius Rucker. <laughs> the singer. <laughs> the singer, yeah. And so he gets up and, you know, and, and I'm bartending and he's playing. And I was like, wow, this is cool. I like it. Yeah. I mean, not a lot of people like, well, I mean, obviously a lot of people like Hootie. But, you know, it's just from being a metal kid and then you know, seeing Nine Inch Nails. And then that kind of opened up 
to listen to other kind of music. You feel you felt at that point like, hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I yeah, maybe, maybe there is more out there. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Because I you know I grew up reading Hit Parader and Circus Magazine. I was the same way, dude. I mean just just to, 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 to tell you, I understand exactly what you mean. I've said yeah. it on here before. I was a metalhead, man. I was into Creator, Destruction, Metallica, Slayer, blah, yes. blah, blah, blah. And there was nothing else. It was like, da, da, yeah, da. yeah, and exactly. And you bring up your other bands, and I'd be like, the posers, oh, they suck, da, 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 da. And then, and then as I got older, it just all changed, you know. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, what am I thinking? Same thing. I mean, it's, it, it, it just happens that way for different reasons probably, but you realize there's a lot more out there. I still love metal. Don't get me wrong. I'm still that guy first probably, yeah. but there I, sure is a lot out there's there. There's always metal in my heart. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, I, I, I wind up seeing him play and I was like, cool. And then Doug comes up to me and puts his arm on, on my shoulder and he goes, Hey man, did you just make fun of my friend's band? I didn't know they were friends. <laughs> and I go, um, what are you talking about? You know, just trying to deny play stupid. It. Yeah, <laughs> stupid. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he goes, well, you said you said that his band, you know, what a stupid effing name for that band. And I go, yeah, I did say that. I go, but I didn't, I don't, I don't know. I was, you know, I was trying to backpedal. And he goes, yeah, no, it is a stupid name. And and he goes, do you want to go to this uh, after party at my house? And I was like, sure. So I go to Doug's house, and then sure enough, Hootie's there. And, uh, you know, Darius comes up to me and goes, what a stupid effing name for a band. <laughs> and, I, and I could not live it down. He didn't forget. He huh? didn't forget. <laughs> and, the, and the crazy part was Hootie eventually then gets signed uh, shortly after uh, that New Year's Eve show. So it was like, boom, they get signed. And then later they bring in Doug's band, Craven Mellon. <laughs> so the guy that I worked for, his band gets signed. And I was like, this is crazy. So, again, now I'm around another artist that I feel has that confidence. Doug has that confidence. And I was like, and, and, and there's you're not something really, there. You're not really around a lot of artists at this time. It's just the no. ones that you're around scheme to keep getting signed and it's, becoming successful. It's, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is, but... I love it. Yeah. I love so, it. So this is giving you that feverish type yeah. thing where you're like, man. And I, I, and I had no desire to do a magazine. Yeah, right. I had, not yet at least. Or right. at least being in the music business. I'm like, I'm going to be in advertising. Yeah. I'm not going to be in, you know, doing this. But it just kept following me or, or I, I kept being in the right place at the right time and meeting these people. And then I would see a certain characteristics about each of these people. And I was like, they've got that. They got that it factor. And then I would get chills. I would get chills on my arm. And then I knew when I heard that music and I'd get the chills, that's the band. I'm, eventually that's how I would pick the cover. I would listen to the music. I'd get the chills and I'm like, that's it. It's needling me. They need to get the cover. And then my staff is like, nobody knows who they are. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't care. And they're like, that's almost business suicide. I mean, who's going to pick up a magazine that they don't know who it is? That's true. So, and it would work. It would, and it would work out for you. When I'm in uh, South Carolina, Greenville, I was working in advertising. They offered me a job, and I was like, "Cool!" I got from an intern making no money because I'm used to that, and now I'm actually going to make money doing what I love. This is going to be cool. Worked there for three months. They lost their biggest account, Dow Chemicals. And they had the two huge buildings, and they had to shut down to half a building. It was it was really they so they let everybody go. So as soon as I got hired, I got fired oh. because they lost the account. Yeah, and I was like, oh my god. And my my best friend out in was in California. He was my roommate in college and and fraternity brother. And he was a stockbroker at the time. Now he owns a huge, massive capital equity firm, and. Uh, I said, hey, man, I said, I just need to get the hell out of here. I go, can I go visit you in California? He goes, yeah, dude, anytime. So I was like, you know what? If I go out there, I'm going to try to get a job working for the biggest ad agencies out there. You know, so there's like Shia Day that did the McIntyre, the Apple ads, you know, that are iconic. Uh, gray advertising, 
Foot Conan Belding. Um, God, there are so many that... Um, okay, I'm going to tell you what. We're going to take a quick break real sure. quick. When we come back, we're going to start right there. We're going to go into... You start... You get into California. Yep. We just got you into get, California. Get into right California. Now. All right, when we come back with Mark Rasmussen. This June 10th Level Up Cleveland Concert Series presents Bittersweet Revenge. You can try Olathea. And Craig Martini. See them all June 10th at the Maple Grove Tavern. Show starts at 8 p.m. 21 or over. Go to levelupcleveland.com for tickets and information. And we are back, everybody, with Mark Rasmussen from No Cover Magazine, and we just got into California. In the in in your story yeah. <laughs> of how you actually got here, such a long drawn out story. Well, no, it's it's a good story. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you're a very interesting guy. Just to be honest, I mean, and to get, you know, there's a lot of things about you that I have questions about. It's like I've wondered, often wondered about how certain things actually transpire with things and you have the answers mm -hmm. so yeah let's get to that point so you're in california yep and basically you're look you're gonna your your idea is you're gonna sign up with the one of the biggest advertising agencies this is your opportunity this yeah. is where they're at let's start right there yeah so i i go out to visit my friend who's a stockbroker i just sent my resumes to all those big ad agencies i mentioned earlier and i got calls from every single one of them i just wanted information. I wanted an information interview. I wanted to know what it, what do I need to do to be on the other side, to be working with you guys. And, uh, after those in information interviews, I had two job offers. I had uh, gray advertising, uh, which is the one I mentioned. And then, uh, foot Kona building was the other one. Um, uh, and, uh, I were, wound up working for, um, farmers insurance. So I was in charge of farmers insurance. I was an account uh, executive for um, advertising, co-op advertising. So basically every single um, agent out there, I was responsible for talking to all those agents. And oh. then when they would approach me and say, hey, we want to do a, an advertising billboard and a campaign. And I was like, okay, cool. All right, where, how much? So that was it. It was really, really boring. But it was my first job in advertising, and I made it to L.A. And I, I got to move out of my friend's apartment in Long Beach, and I was doing that commute for a long time, going back and forth, back and forth from Long Beach to L.A. It doesn't seem very far, but in uh, rush hour traffic. Yeah, both, in, in, in L.A., that's In far. L.A., both, both ways. 100 feet is far. Yeah. In the morning, <laughs> Oh, it was painful. But afterwards, you're ready to go home, and you're like, you're stuck in traffic again for another three hours. And I'm like, this. And I get to my friend's apartment, and I'm like, all right, this is it. I'm I'm out. I'm I'm getting a place in Brentwood. You know, so it was right where the ad agency was. I, I worked at the World Savings uh, Building right there on uh, Wilshire Boulevard. And uh, it was cool because you could see the, the 405 freeway. <laughs> and actually what's kind of funny is it was this tells you the time frame that I'm talking about because it was right when the OJ happened. Oh, the white blazer? The white blazer. I I literally <laughs> was in uh we were watching it on the monitors on the TV at the ad agency and I was like, wait a minute, that's in my I could see that from my office. Oh. So I went to my office and I, I looked out the window and I saw the white blazer, you know, and I was like, This is pretty crazy. Yeah. This is like, this is weird. Um, and then right around the corner from where I was living was where uh, Nicole lived. And they did the candlelight vigils and everything. And so it was really surreal because I just got to L.A. And all this is happening. All man. this crazy media and it all this crazy. stuff. And I was like, what is going on? Yeah. So, um, and then I, 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 I so. I don't want to distract, but I wind up working with Sean Brown, Nicole Simpson Brown's nephew, 
later on, um, putting on the California Music Festival. Oh, going down down the road later on that happened. Down, down the road, yeah. We wind up meeting, and I needed some money, and he invested into my festival. But um, anyways, going back to the ad agency part, so I was, I was working in advertising, and then, again, I lost my job. We lost the account. We had that account for 50. That was the other reason I chose that account, because that account was with the company for 50 years. I'm like, this account's not going anywhere. Yeah, right. The other account, I remember I was like, I was a brand new account, maybe three years, but it was more fun. I think, it, I don't really know if it was Mattel Toys or something something cool. You know? And I was like, three years, 50 years. I already lost my job. I don't want to lose another one. So I went with 50 years. And un- unfortunately, um, we lost that account. And it was due to, it was due to my, uh, my boss at the time uh, having some relationships with the, uh, with the client. And uh, he broke it off with her, and took, she took away the account. Wow. So we all lost our job. And I'm in Brentwood, and it's expensive. So uh, during that time, I meet this guy. His name's Scott Prezant. Scott came and uh, he wanted to work at that agency too. He was a creative guy. He was a graphic designer and he wanted to get into the creative field of advertising. He went to Fullerton um, and he studied advertising as well. And we became friends and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll try to get you in, you know? And then all of a sudden he called me and I'm like, dude, I just lost my job. I got nothing. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to pay for my apartment. I, I've got school loans. I, I don't like, I just got here. I got a car payment. And he goes, he said, like, don't worry about it. He goes, I have backup. He goes, I was just calling about that. He goes, um, I'm going to be working for a magazine. I'm like, really? I'm like, I worked for a magazine in Cleveland. And he goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, it's called Fearless. And I was like, cool. I'm like, all right. He goes, maybe I can introduce you to the owners. I'm like, yeah, that'd be great. So I go and I meet with the owners of Fearless. And uh, I'm like, hey, um, I have experience. Scott mentioned you're looking for somebody. And, you know, yeah, you're a great fit. We'd love to have you. Be great. And I was like, cool. I'm like, I got to ask how much how much am I going to get paid because I've got, I got big bills, I man. I got big bills, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, well, you're going to get 20% of whatever you bring in. I was like, Damn. I never got 20% in Cleveland. I'm like, okay, cool. What's my salary? No, that's all you get. I'm like, all right, well, let me see the magazine because then if I see the magazine, I'll know that I can sell it. I'm like, what is it all about? He's like, well, it's music oriented. You know, and I was like, cool. Where is it? Well, it doesn't exist. We're just starting. And I'm like, oh, all right. Well, hey, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed talking with you guys. I look forward to following up. Called up Scott. I said, Scott, why the hell do you want to work for somebody that's just doing a startup magazine? How are you going to get paid? He goes, I don't know. He's like, they, pay, they said they were going to pay me after the first issue. And I'm like, I go, you know what? You and I can start a magazine together. And if you and I make zero, we make zero. If you and I make some money, you and I make more than the 20% I would have gotten. And he goes, that makes sense. And I'm, I'm like, okay. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me think about this. I'm like, okay, cool. It goes by. And then I was still, I mean, I had a little bit of money. And it was like two months later. I'm not even working. I'm on an, on an unemployment. And uh, Scott comes and he's like, I've got it. And I go, what? And he shows me on a piece of paper like this. And he just writes the word scratch, scratch. And I was like, scratch, what the hell scratch. That's our magazine. I go, what's it about? And he goes, it's a music magazine. I'm like, okay, it's going to be punk and ska music. And I'm like, I know what punk music is. What the hell is ska music? And he played some and I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm not a big fan, but let's do it. And so I went. I created a, a rate sheet just like I did and I, when I learned from working with River Burns. And I went, and I was living in Venice at the time, and he was living in Fullerton. So I said, let's just focus on L.A., you know, like Santa Monica, Venice, everything. I know you want to do Fullerton, but maybe we can do some magazines over there. And uh, he's like, okay, that sounds good. So I went around 
to downtown Venice where I was, uh, I, I wound up moving from the expensive apartment to this rent control in Santa Monica. So I was really close and I would go down to the beach and I would see the tattoo shops and I would see the record stores and I would see the restaurants and I would tell them my concept. And they're like, oh yeah, this sounds great. And I didn't ask for much. I asked 50 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever, you know. And they're like, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll do it. And I was like, cool. So I got all the ads. He put all the content together. Scott was in charge of all the music and the content and designing. And he also worked at Kinko's at the time. So we literally went at night when he was the, ma he was the manager and nobody was there. And we just printed off copies and copies and, <laughs> copies and copies and copies and copies and stapled them and stapled them and stapled them. I mean, it was rough. I should have brought you a lot a, of time, a lot of time involved, huh? A lot of time. I should have brought you a copy. I mean, because it literally was just, it was a total zine. And uh, we, we used, we borrowed the paper. We just haven't returned it yet. So I like to say we borrowed it. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't take anything. We just, we haven't returned it. So then we distributed, we got it all around and we got it in LA and Santa Monica and everything. And then uh, Scott's like, Hey, come on out, you know? And uh, he's like, uh, let's go celebrate. And I'm like, all right, where are we going to go? He's like, let's go to Denny's. So we went to Denny's. And he started passing the magazine out around Orange County, which I didn't know he was doing. Um, these kids had the magazine at the table while we were eating at, at Denny's. And this guy goes, look, look, look. He goes, those kids got a magazine. And I was like, yeah, they do. He's like, we should go talk to them. I go, all right, if we talk to them, don't tell them it's our magazine. Let's try to get some intel. Let's try to see what they like about it. And he goes, okay, okay. So sure enough, we go over there and we're like, hey, what's going on? And he's like, oh, you know, and he's like, what's that? What are you guys reading? He goes, oh, it's a new magazine. It's called Scratch. And at the time, we had um, Brad uh, or Sublime on the cover. Oh, Bradley. Bradley. And uh, we had a picture of them when they played at the Whiskey. And uh, we had the interview with them, and the kids were reading it, and they're like, oh, this – band's awesome they're really good and i'm like oh okay cool and like what do you think of the magazine I'm like oh it's so cool and then all of a sudden scott's like that's our magazine <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't keep it over he there. couldn't keep it yeah <laughs> and i was like scott and then they're like hey they're like can we play like a backyard barbecue for you guys or something to get in the magazine and i'm like we both live in apartments i don't think our landlord's gonna appreciate that one and uh and scott started thinking he goes well, wait a minute. I go, I have a friend. His father owns the shack in Anaheim. Maybe we can do something. Maybe you can do like a show. We can do a scratch show and we can have this, you guys play. And you're like, yeah, we'll bring our friends. And we're like, okay, cool. So we're like, what's the name of your band? And they're like, um, Save Ferris. And I'm like, Save Ferris. Okay, whatever. So it was Monique and Brian. I don't know if you guys know Save Ferris, but they were, I don't. They were a ska band that got signed back in the day. So, like, after No Doubt, you know, and Monique sounds a lot like No Doubt, um, or uh, Gwen from No Doubt. Stefani, yeah. Yeah, sounds a lot like her. And uh, so, first show we did was we, we talked to the shack, and they're like, okay, we'll give you two Tuesday nights. You can do all ages. And so, the all ages was $3 uh, every Tuesday night, holds 500 people, and then you have to do a two-drink minimum after that. And so we got the $3 at the door. The two drinks were obviously soda, right, um, or water. But it was like 5 bucks. Yeah, right. They charged for that yeah, stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. It was expensive at the time, right? And it's still expensive. I mean, $5 for a soda. But uh, that's what they did. So basically, it's a $13 cover for these kids, and they paid it. And we sold out every single time. So the first show we had – was Save Ferris, I remember that, and then they brought their friends, the Aquabats. And in the Aquabats at the time was the drummer, Travis Barker. Oh, Blink-182, right? Now, now Blink-182, <laughs> yeah. At the time, he was with the Aquabats. Got it. And so we booked that show, and then we did Voodoo Glow Skulls, we did No Effects, we did Bad Religion, we did wow. pretty much every major, we did Real Big Fish, um... God, every major punk ska band at the time. So, yeah, that scene 
was kind of like at that point still kind of like there. It hadn't. It hadn't no. d- done what it was, it was about to do. Right. Who knew? Right. right. It's kind of like I, 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 I would think, I and mean, I wasn't there in, in uh, Seattle during the grunge era, right? So I was part of this Orange County scene, even though I lived in Venice at the time or, or Santa Monica. Um, it was an area that I would always go, right? And um, oh, what is their band? Uh, Dexter's band, uh, Offspring. Oh, yeah. Right, so Offspring, too. And a lot of these bands, then they get signed, right? So Offspring gets signed, No Effects gets signed, and No Effects starts Fat Records, and then Offspring starts Nitro Records, and then uh, Kung Fu Records from the Vandals, right? So all these indie cool bands now are starting their own indie incubator record labels. Labels, yeah. Yeah, and I was like, so then all of those people I knew... When uh, they started advertising in Scratch because they're like, well, you guys booked us. You know, you guys are the scene. We know your publication, you know. So that worked out. And then I got a call. I had my resumes out and I got a call from Honda for their ad agency. And I got big money thrown at me. And so I was like, oh, I can't do this magazine anymore. And so I go to my partner, Scott, I go, yeah, just buy me out, you know, because I, I have to go work. You know, I'm just barely floating, you know, I'm treading water here and it's expensive to live in L.A. And so even though we were starting to make a little money, we where we made enough money where we turned from going to Kinko's to actually going to a web press. Ugh. And we were printing the magazine now at a web press. And then we would do 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. And we had them everywhere, all over Orange County, all over L.A. And then it just started really, like, advertising coming. And, and record labels were showing up. And a r people were showing up. And bands were getting signed. And it was exciting, exciting, exciting time. But I got bills to pay. And I'm not making, barely making it, right? And I'm going month by month wondering if I'm going to be going back to Cleveland. You know, a couple times I felt like, okay, I'm coming home. This is it. I cannot survive out here any longer. And so I was able to get that job with that ad agency for Honda, Ruben Poster and Associates. And I worked for them. And then I jumped and I worked for um, Suisa Miller, which was part of American Honda, which was on Acura. So then I, I moved to a different agency, moved up the ranks. And uh, I was an account director now. And then I meet these these guys, and they were working there. And they're just like, hey, you know, let's do a magazine. Because I showed them what I used to do. And they're like, yeah, let's do that. I'm like, well, I, I can't do scratch. I'm not going to do punk ska. I go, because I'm not going to take away from that. I mean, that was my business partner. I said, we got to do something different. I go, let's just focus on new music because it seems like, and that's what I thought. I thought it was all just new music getting signed. I didn't understand at the time that Scratch was such a niche market, you know, niche magazine that punk ska, and that's why it it did so well. So I was like, let's just focus on bands before they get signed. Nobody's doing it, right? Rolling Stone puts major bands on there. Spin Magazine puts major bands on. Nobody's putting like local, unknowns, unknowns. Yeah. yeah yeah so we started no cover that was it and we literally we came up with a bunch of stupid names and, and I, have, I still have the list of all the dumb names for the magazine for the magazine oh yeah, yeah. you remember any of them uh stomp i don't know why i just said I mean, it's not terrible stomp. <laughs> yeah. stomp i don't know what my back my my idea was but then just get I, your attention right I mean, yeah yeah was, but then no cover was on the list right and then this girl's like, well, why don't you do no cover? And I'm like, no cover. Yeah, I, I did. I wrote it down, you know, as one of my, but I, I really was on stop for some reason. And she's like, no, 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 no cover. Because it's free. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it covers a lot of different things. One, that two words can mean a variety of things, right? Exactly. So no cover because it was free. And it was like no cover charge, right? So you get stamped and it would say no cover on your on your hand. 
And then also original music, right? No cover bands, no cover music, no cover. It's all original music. And so that's why we stuck with no cover. And then we started focusing on bands before they were big, but it had to be original music. And first band we put on our cover, we would go to the Derby. And uh, at the time, it was swing dancing was really, really popular. I mean, it was, I'm really dating myself, <laughs> but uh, th there was a band called Big Babadoo Daddy, and they were like the house band, and they would play and play and play, and we'd all go dare, and they would teach you to swing dance, and I thought I was cool, and, and you know, you'd dress in a certain way and everything, and it was like the total L.A. thing to do, and then the movie Swingers came out, and they were in the movie. Oh. And then the magazine was out just at the same time. It was just the perfect timing. timing. And then I had every person calling me, how did you know? How did you know? We want to advertise. We want to advertise. And I was like, whoa, this is blowing up more than Scratch did. You know, I've got major advertisers now coming at me. And I was like, okay. And, and you know, I put the next issue out. And then I was like, ah, it was like, eh, boom. Nobody, nobody knew who that person was, and then it didn't really matter. And then, you know, I put the next issue out. Nobody cared. Nobody knew anybody. Then I put the, the – then I got a call for from the publicist with Ziggy Marley. And I'm like, well, this is a no-brainer. If I put Ziggy Marley, he was like, has he ever had a cover? He's like, no, this is his first outing, and you'd be his first cover. Yeah. And I was like, okay, that's a no-brainer. So I put Ziggy Marley back – start tra trajectory you know but you know i was like all right that was a, that was a gimme right the next one i did was ben harper love ben harper love 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 ben harper and i i would see him play he wasn't signed and i put ben harper on started going up and he gets signed and i was like oh this is cool he just got signed and then i did a few other flops and then I got to, uh, I did Crystal Method, uh, where I had Alexandra Greenberg, if she's watching, which she's a friend of mine, um, she may see this. But she literally was one of my first writers. And she winds up going, becoming a publicist, and then working for Mitch Snyder Organization. And then, you know, she was the vice president. She ran Coachella for publicist. Oh, and sure. she did a lot of uh, stuff. She works with Stevie Oki. She works with Crystal Method. She worked with Korn as their publicist. All starting working for me, which was kind of cool, you know. And we've had a lot of other people successful, like Roger Lynn Smith wrote for um, Rolling Stone. Uh, we had J.R. Griffin. Uh, he wrote for AP Magazine out here for a while. Um uh, who else? Uh, da, 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 da. We had Kenny Morrison. He used to shoot our um, actual covers. And then he went on, and we had uh, Incubus on one of our first covers. And actually, that was my first event ever was I did a concert with Incubus. Uh, my launch party was with Incubus, even though I had um, uh, a different band on the cover at the time. Uh, I, I met those guys, and then I'm like, I want you guys. I want you guys. And then... So they were still a baby band. And so I wound up working with this girl's boyfriend that worked at the ad agency that I was at. And his name was, uh, he goes by Lou Dog from the Cottonmouth Kings, <laughs> right? So he's the drummer for the Cottonmouth Kings. And April was the girl that was, he was dating at the time. And she introduces me to Lou Dog. And I remember going to his condo and smoking a lot of weed. And, uh, <laughs> And then he's like, at the end of this cloud of smoke, we're just like, let's uh, let's do this. Let's make a party. You know, let's launch your magazine. He goes, I can help you guys. And he did. He really did. And so we had Incubus, and he's like, we're gonna we're gonna play on there too at Cottonmouth Kings. And then we had this band. They were on Warner Brothers Records at the time, and they were advertising with me. All right, stop right there. Yep. And we're going to find out who that band is in one minute when we come back with Mark Rasmussen from No Cover Magazine in one minute. <laughs> this June 10th Level Up Cleveland Concert Series presents Bittersweet Revenge. You can try Olathea. And Craig Martini. Here, 
See them all June 10th at the Maple Grove Tavern. Show starts at 8 p.m. 21 or over. Go to levelupcleveland.com for tickets and information. And we are back, everybody, with Mark Rasmussen from No Cover Magazine. And we're about to find out who that band was that was playing in that show. Who was it? Who was the band? Yeah, so most people probably won't even know, although I would highly recommend looking them up because they're an incredible uh, band back in the day. Uh, they played with Limp Bizkit. They played with Corn. They played a lot of great artists. Uh, just, you know, didn't work out for them as, as a career. But they were called Dial 7. And <laughs> actually, the interesting thing about Dial 7 is there was a guy named Daniel in the band. He was the, the scratcher, the DJ guy. Um, back in the day, that's when they always did that. Every single band seemed to have a little scratcher DJ guy. And uh, I've maintained a main, uh, strong, strong relationship with Daniel. Actually, Daniel was here last year uh, for Neva, 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 whatever it is. Uh, and then uh, I go out there and I do events with him uh, out there. But the funny part was, as I was out there in California last month, or February, it was February, and I'm, I'm doing uh, one of my events with Daniel. Daniel tells me, guess who's getting married? And I go, who? He goes, Barrett, our bass player. Remember Barrett? And I go, yeah, yeah, I remember Barrett. And he goes, guess who he's, he's marrying? Because I'm like, wait a minute. Didn't Barrett go into porn? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. And I go, well, who's he marrying? He goes, Stormy Daniels. <laughs> I can't make this shit up, man. Uh, it's, it's just unbelievable. No way did I ever see that one coming. Yeah. Not Stormy Daniels. I, I, oh, I, my God. It blew my mind. I could not believe. That is hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, it was It was funny. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, and he did. He went through. He got married. I asked, I go, Daniel, did he? Did he? did he do it? He goes, yep. He's married to her. Did you talk to him after this? Barrett? Yeah. No, I haven't talked to Barrett forever. I've, I've no, only... but did you talk to him since he got married to Stormy Daniels? No, I... no. I, I mean, I haven't had a relationship with Barrett for a long, long time. I was a stronger relationship with Daniel in the band. I got you. And then Daniel and I worked together on events. And then Daniel and Barrett are still friends, obviously, right? Um, but <laughs> Daniel's wife wouldn't let him go to the to the wedding. <laughs> too many porn stars. Yeah, too many porn stars. So, and that, that's the crazy thing about obviously living in LA, right? You're surrounded by stuff that just only happens in LA. Only man. happens in LA, yeah. and and you meet people, and, and you know all I would say characters or, or colorful people or porn stars or or whatever, and it sure. just almost becomes normal. And it, it, it and I'm just going to digress a little bit, but. The time I met my wife, uh, Carmen, that I'm married to now, my first date that I took her to, I was like, oh, this is going to be cool. Uh, Mayhem Music Festival is there, and I know I know John and John and Mayhem. I can get in. I can go backstage. I'm going to impress her, and I know all the bands that are playing. And So I, I go take her to Mayhem Music Festival, which, one, she loves country music. She ha doesn't really care for metal music. Um, except the 80s hair bands and, and Guns N' Roses. But uh, <laughs> nothing really super, super heavy. And But I took her anyways because I, you know, I was like, oh, this is going to impress her. <clears throat> we're backstage. We're hanging out. We're just talking, having some drinks and stuff. And then I see um, Rusty Coons. Rusty Coons was in the band Attica 7. I don't know if you guys have seen heard. I've heard of Attica 7, yeah. So Attica 7, uh, he was in prison when he wrote all the songs for that. He was, uh, I think he got busted uh, for meth dealing or, or something ridiculous. And, you know, he went away for a very, very long time. And then in jail, he rehabilitated himself and he played music. You know, that was what he was doing. And then he had this idea of starting this band. And so he does, and he winds up getting on to um, uh, Mayhem Music Festival, and then he's a singer was a guy from Biohazard. Do you remember Biohazard? Yeah, that's Evan Seinfeld. Exactly. 
So Evans the same. And he married a porn star also, by the way. There you go. Uh-huh. This is what I'm leading up to. <laughs> so I'm backstage with Rusty, and you know, Rusty's wearing his cut because I guess he was part of the Hells Angels. He was president of the Hells Angels. And so he was, you know, there. And so first thing my wife is like, okay, there's Rusty from the Hells Angels. And then all of a sudden Evan comes over and we start talking. And I had a crazy story with Evan from Biohazard when I was in uh, Arizona. I got way too many stories. I got to stay focused. But the the long and short of it is, so Evan comes over and then his porn star wife comes over. And she's one of the best looking porn star wives that there ever was. Right. Yeah. But I don't know what happened because I'm talking to Evan and I'm talking to Rusty, but he, her and my wife were talking and they didn't get along. Uh-oh. And my wife just flipped out. And she was my girlfriend at the time. I mean, it was my first uh, first real date, I guess. I mean, I had a couple dates before. But first date that I really wanted to impress her. <coughs> and she drove. And so next thing I know, I was like, where did she go? And they're like, oh, she left. I'm like, what? She's my ride. And I'm like, and then I was like trying to figure out why she's mad. And she's like, I don't know who you are <laughs> or where you come from or you think this is normal, but... Hanging out with the Hells Angels and porn stars isn't my cup of tea. <laughs> and I was like, wow. I just, it, to me. It turned into something that, yeah, you were like, you thought this was going to be impressive and you know people. Well, I just thought on the music end of it. I, yeah. I, I, I don't, I mean, I was around it so often that it almost became Took like. Took on a normal kind of a feel. Yeah, which yeah. to me, it's really not, it's not normal for me. I mean, I, just from where I grew up and my roots here in Cleveland. So to go out there and just like, oh, here it is. It's in your face. And then you become normalized, I guess. And then you just, you know, you see it. Like, you go to concert after concert. You meet the same people. They're good people, you know. It's just, it's not my scene, right? And so I was trying to explain to her. I'm like, I don't actually hang out with them. I just know them yeah. association from working in the magazine and, and all that stuff. So, um, so doing the magazine. She obviously bought it. She Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eventually, okay. eventually it all worked all right, out. And now it. she's very accepting. Thank you, Carmen. Okay. <laughs> very accepting. She she gets it, right? She doesn't come to a lot of the events because she knows there's going to be whatever, and so she just avoids it, yeah. which is fine. Um, 